Go. This is Thursday, May 1st, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Michael P. Forte. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born on the 11th of February, 1927. And where were you born? In Kingston, New York. And where do you currently live? I live in Wellesley Hills, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Is married. And do you have children? I have uh, six children. How many grandchildren? Eleven grandchildren. Any great-grandchildren? And one grandchild. Congratulations. And tell us a little bit about Kingston, New York, growing up. Well, it's a small town mm -hmm. north of New York City, about uh, uh, 90 to 100 miles uh, up the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, located on a river that uh, in Kingston is over a mile across. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's not like the rivers that we see here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Uh, being a small town, uh, most all of us uh, went through the public schools and, uh, and Kingston High School, mm -hmm. which uh, both my wife and I attended. In fact, we attended the same schools for grammar school as well. So you got to know each other pretty well. Well, we were neighbors, actually, too. Ah, okay. So we did know each other. Mm -hmm. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my father ran a business uh, in painting and uh, refinishing uh, automobiles. My mother raised a family of six, uh, five, I guess it was. Oh. It was five. Mm -hmm. And uh, in her later years, during the Depression, which I recall very vividly, uh, she worked in a, a uh, factory. As I mentioned earlier, there was plenty of work for women in the city of Kingston, but mm -hmm. not too much for men. Uh, so my mother and my two oldest sisters both ended up working in factories. Mm -hmm. What other memories do you have of the Depression? I have the memories of uh, uh, going out to my grandparents' farm and working on the farm uh, as kind of a way of earning our keep because we shared in the fruits of the farm and both uh, vegetables and fruits mm -hmm. and and meats, uh, eggs, mm -hmm. and my mo my grandmother was quite a a uh, uh, entrepreneur for making uh, home brew mm -hmm. and 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 even more powerful things during <laughs> the depression, and that helped to pay the mortgage bills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, and when you were in school, were you made aware of events that were happening in Europe and Asia? Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Very aware of them. And what year did, did you graduate from Kingston High? 1944. So you were in, I believe you were either in junior high or high school when Pearl Harbor was bombed. That is correct. Did I remember mm -hmm. the day of a Pearl Harbor bombing mm -hmm. very vividly because my brother and I and one of our neighbors were out at the state armory playing a little bit of basketball and as we were about to leave just about noontime we heard the announcement of the mm -hmm. bombing of Pearl Harbor. It's like the memories that you have of significant events. Mm -hmm. I can still clearly remember that day. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a, uh, what was um, high school like during the war years? 
Well, uh, again, uh, all the members of the family had to pitch in and earn money as they could to help the family. Because mm -hmm. uh, things were very, very tough. They were not well off. And uh, I had jobs uh, either working with my father in his shop, or I worked for the public education department uh, uh, painting and caulking windows and things on schools for 50 cents an hour. <laughs> but that was a, a welcome thing, 50 mm -hmm. cents an hour. Right. It helped to put meals on the table. Mm -hmm. Do you remember other things during the war, such as blackouts and scrap drives? Yes, I do. I mm -hmm. remember them vividly. My father was quite active. He was uh, one of the air raid wardens, and uh, uh, he had to make sure that people in the neighborhood got their <clears throat> houses blacked out when mm -hmm. it was blackout time. Also, re remember very vividly the rationing that mm. took place for sugar and gasoline and uh, other commodities. Uh, they're the two that I remember the most. Right. <clears throat> okay, graduated in 1944. Tell us what happened next. Well, not very long after. And I went to work actually in a defense factory. Uh, as a toolmaker's apprentice, and uh, turned out I could have stayed out of the service because I was working in a essential defense industry. But people, all my friends were in the service or going in the service, and I wasn't uh, going to be an exception. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered uh, the Navy into what was then known as the the uh, Eddy program, named after a Captain Eddy in the Navy, to teach the new field of electronics, wow. which is what I got on into. I took a test uh, down in Poughkeepsie, New York, mm -hmm. and apparently I qualified <laughs> because I got uh, an invitation to join the Navy. The, the, the very uh, early in uh, 1945, mm -hmm. January 45. And I went uh, from there, I went uh, to New York to mm -hmm. Grand Central Palace, which is where the recruiting station was. And from there on a train out of Grand Central to Great Lakes, Illinois at the boot camp. Tell us what BASIC was like. Well, BASIC was very, very quick uh, over. Mm -hmm. uh, it was terrible. <laughs> you had to get out and early start running what they called a grinder, and that was uh, to get you in shape for the rest of the day. And uh, it turned out our, our boot camp got foreshortened because of the fact that they had this cat fever and they were afraid that it was going to spread too much. So they, I think they, they finished us uh, a week or two early, mm -hmm. and I was off for Dearborn, Michigan. And where, wh where what was in Dearborn, Michigan? Excuse well, that, uh, that was a, a, a sec. Actually, I, I had a, a brief stop in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That was called primary school for electronics. And from there, about two months later, I went to Dearborn, Michigan, which was a primary school. Uh, and I was actually stationed at the Ford plant at the River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan, which had been given to the Navy for training purposes. It had mm -hmm. been the Ford training school. So from January until you, you're now stationed at this Ford plant, sounds as though the war is winding down. Do you remember? I remember one very significant thing, and that was a day that 
President Roosevelt died. Mm -hmm. I was at uh, Dearborn at that time, and soon after I left there and I went to what was called secondary school down in Corpus Christi, Texas. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the aviation side of electronics. I was aiming towards becoming an aviation electronic technician's mate. And that was a very good school. Learned a great deal about this new field, mm -hmm. which I knew nothing about before mm -hmm. I went into the service. Okay. When were you sent to Corpus Christi again? Well, it probably was, uh, my guess, about July, June or July of 45. Okay. So you were in April when FDR died. Yep. Which, um, where were you in May? Were you still in Dearborn? When? I, I think I had gone to Corpus Christi. Okay. And this is when Germany surrendered. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Do anything for VE Day? Well, I remember it. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of celebration. But I, I was busy working at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was no course of relaxation. You mm -hmm. worked. <laughs> I also <laughs> played baseball while I was at Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. I was still hopeful of becoming a baseball player one day. And then mm -hmm. uh, when I finished Corpus Christi, mm -hmm. I got the opportunity to volunteer to go to, to uh, the Pacific and participate in the Operations Crossroads. And That's how it all happened. Okay, so tell us about about Operation Crossroads, which was the? It was the atomic bomb test held at the Bikini Atoll of the Marshall Islands, mm -hmm. and it included uh, a whole variety of different uh, test mm -hmm. experiments mm -hmm. to determine the effect of nuclear weapons on ships, on animals, mm -hmm. on materials, uh, on whether the uh, and the two basic uh, things were the above the ground uh, blast and the below the water blast. And that was um, able. Able test was mm -hmm. the one that was dropped from a B twenty nine, mm -hmm. hopefully to target the, the the center ship, the USS Nevada, mm -hmm. uh, a a. Uh, a battleship, mm -hmm. and uh, it missed it, but it was close enough that it did a great deal of damage. Yes, and for those of the um, those who are watching this interview, are more interested in Operation Crossroads, there is a declassified documentary available on YouTube. That's correct. Mm -hmm. It's a very good one. Yes, it is. It shows a great deal about the tests that, mm -hmm. at one time, were classified uh, security-wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was good to hear about them, mm -hmm. in many cases, well after the mm -hmm. things happened. Now, at the, at the time you were in Bikini, what was your rate? I was an electronic technician's mate, third class. Okay. And what were your duties? I had uh, electronics people were very much in short supply, and there was a great a number of communications equipments, transmitters, receivers, uh, 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 radar, uh, all the equipment that's used in, in, on the uh, aircraft of the ship I was on. I was on the USS Fall River mm -hmm. for a good part of the time, and we had two Sea Scouts on the uh, cruiser that were launched off of these catapults. And I was responsible for the electronics on board those planes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was the only airborne trained technician that they mm -hmm. had. And we were very busy. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a consequence, I slept in the, the transmitter room on the main deck. So I'd be close to where the Mm -hmm. The work was. 
Tell us a little bit more about the day that they did the test. Was it hot, humid? Oh yes, it, uh, of mm -hmm. course Bikini is uh, right in the, the hottest area you can get it. Mm -hmm. It gets to be very humid. And we got to go uh, ashore mm -hmm. a number of times uh, before the tests. After the test, we didn't go ashore. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they didn't want us really getting in contact with the water, which was still mm -hmm. highly radioactive, mm. particularly after the second test, which mm -hmm. was the Baker test, right. where the, the mm -hmm. weapon was detonated underwater. Mm -hmm. So it contaminated the ships uh, and everything around the mm -hmm. lagoon. Now you mentioned you were, being, you were on board the USS Fall River. That's correct. Where in the testing area was the Fall River? Was it kind of well, away? We were off, uh, we were one of the closest ones, uh, mm -hmm. but we were about eight miles from the center of the, the target area. And I recorded on a wire recorder uh, Probably never heard of a wire recorder, but that's what <laughs> preceded tape recorders. Right. And uh, I recorded the broadcast from the B-29 that dropped the bomb. In okay. fact, it turned out to be a very popular item. Wow. And I uh, made many copies for other members of the crew. So you, and I take it you got to see the blasts? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. I saw both of them. What did you? What were you thinking? <laughs> well, the first one particularly, uh, uh, you took with a bit of trepidation because mm -hmm. there, were, there was a great deal unknown about it mm -hmm. as to what damage it would cause. But uh, uh, we soon found that uh, the ships were quite survivable. Mm -hmm. I think they were damaged more by the underwater blast due to the fact that uh, the water is not compressible. Right. The, the, water, the water just transmits the shock right uh, from the source, mm -hmm. whereas the air drop, uh, it was in the air, and therefore a lot of the force mm -hmm. is dissipated before it gets to the targets. Right. But still, that, was, that must have been for a but, pretty impressive sight. You know, well, we wore these glasses also because mm -hmm. if you're looking at it, uh, it's extremely bright light. Mm. We had goggles to wear. And uh, I was out on the main deck uh, looking mm -hmm. for it to happen. <laughs> While I was in, in, in the uh, radio room, I was recording the voices from the, the plane. Wow, the that's Dave's amazing. The dream, it was called. Mm -hmm. All right, tell us what happened after Bikini. Well, after Bikini, uh, I, I actually gave serious thought to staying in the Navy. This uh, new field of electronics was exciting. But then I decided, now I think I'm going to go to college. Mm -hmm. I had the GI Bill, which uh, many of us took advantage of. And I did register uh, and mm -hmm was accepted at Union College in Schenectady, New York in the class of 51, started in 1947. And I studied electrical engineering oh, since that was my main interest and enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I was a little older as many of the veterans were. There were two groups. The, those that are getting directly out of high school and those that were returning from the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, the older ones sort of, we took things very seriously and uh, participated in as much of the activities as we could. Some of it was a little m less uh, interesting, so I personally got involved with projects we got a, a, a World War II radar that I had worked on down at uh, Corpus Christi uh, out of the uh, surplus market in New York. 
And uh, I was able to put that together and get it working. Mm -hmm. And the, it was used in the electrical engineering department at Union to sort of demonstrate, here's, here's what a lot of this theory ends up in. Wow. <laughs> I also worked on a, a thing called a Marx impulse generator, which is an artificial lightning generator. Another student and I built this, and then we wrote a paper for the American Institute of Electrical Engineers mm -hmm. student uh, convention, mm -hmm. and we got an award for that, uh, the paper that we wrote. But I enjoyed doing the, the, the hands-on things because that's what we did in the Navy. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't have to go and learn how to use the electronic instruments. I knew how to do that already mm -hmm. from my Navy training. Okay, tell us, okay, have, I take it you graduated from Union? I graduated from Union in 1951 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. And I went to work for General Electric Company in Schenectady, New York. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't there very long and the Air Force, who had given me a commission out of Union, have my last two years uh, I joined ROTC and it was mm -hmm. Air Force ROTC, which is, explains why I ended up in the Air Force. Okay. So I was one of the fresh, brand new second lieutenants and I got called in for the Korean War. And they shipped me out to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which was sort of the center for the Air Force's research and development work. Uh -huh. and, and for the newly formed Air Research and Development Command, which I became a part of. And I got to be trained in project management mm -hmm. using my technical and managerial background from Union uh, mm -hmm. to, to uh, get further trained by the Air Force Institute of Technology and uh, Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Ohio State sent professors over to Wright-Patterson that we uh -huh. sat through the classes day after day after day mm -hmm. for about a month, a uh, month and a half it was. And at the end of that time, we had an opportunity to, to opt for an assignment to one of the six new uh, research and development centers, uh, which included uh, Wright-Patterson and, and uh, uh, the uh, Romare Development Center uh -huh. and Tullahoma, Tennessee, and, mm -hmm. and another one out in Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And uh, I chose the one at Rome because it was closest to home and closest to where I had come from. So I become an R&D officer mm -hmm. and a project engineer at, uh, at the uh, RADC, Rome Air Development Center. And I got involved in displays and uh, communications equipment and radar equipment. And uh, eventually I, I gravitated into a new field, uh, sort of a specialization of electronics called miniaturization. Miniaturization of electronics. Because everything when we started out was all tubes mm -hmm. and uh, big resistors and capacitors, uh -huh. big components. And all of a sudden comes the, first the sub-miniature tube and then the transistor. Uh -huh. And the whole body of solid state devices which I grew up with. <laughs> so I got involved heading up this electronic miniaturization center. We did largely in-the-house projects for urgent needs uh, under what they called a quick reaction capability program. So I can't really speak too much about what I did specifically, but mm -hmm. they were they were things that led to our mm -hmm. uh, activities to contain Russia 
-hmm. or the Soviet at that time. So I was involved in a great deal of that kind of work, uh -huh. floating balloons over the Soviet Union and <laughs> gathering information. Okay. And how long were you in the Air Force? Well, altogether, I started in 1951, and I got out in 1981, so 30 years. Okay. And were you and, always stationed at Rome, New York? Or? No, I no. was at Wright-Patterson, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of the time uh, I was at Rome, or I went, I got out of the Air Force military uh, active duty, mm -hmm. but I stayed in the reserve. Okay. And when, uh, when did you leave active duty? I left active duty in 1953. Three. Okay. Yeah, 53. Mm -hmm. But I stayed very active with the Air Force, mm -hmm. and I took many courses with uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology and I took uh, a whole series of uh, career courses for officers, uh, the mm -hmm. squadron officers course, the, mm -hmm. the uh, command and staff school, and the mm -hmm. uh, Air Force War College. Wow. And the College of the Industrial, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. So these were very, some of them, particularly three of them, were very extensive courses mm -hmm. where you had to do some research and writing papers uh, about current things. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you were in the military during that very interesting period when there, like, for example, airplanes turned from props to jets. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, yes. of course, you were on the ground floor for a lot of the development within the Air Force and within the military yes. uh, for all, the, all the, uh, the electronic and now computers and what have you. I was just looking the, oh, three or four weeks ago at a book that I got. Mm -hmm. When I was in the Air Force, I was chosen to go down to Bell Telephone Laboratories in uh, New Jersey. And uh, the purpose was to attend a review of the new field of electronics namely the transistor. Mm -hmm. And I have this book at home that is uh, all about the transistor and the, the people that invented it. And we heard them lecture wow. while I was down there. And that was quite an event when I think of it, mm -hmm. to be on the threshold of a whole new era of electronics, mm -hmm. solid state. Why, what we do today with our cell phones and our, all these gadgets as they have evolved, that uh, all came out of the transistor, mm -hmm. an American innovation. Incredible evolution. Yes, it is, mm -hmm. yes. So when you left active duty, what was your rank? When I left active duty, uh, let's see, I was a captain, I think. And when, no, yeah, I was a captain. Okay, captain. And when you left reserved in 1981? I was, was a colonel, full colonel. Wow. <laughs> well, as I said, I had to take mm -hmm. all the same courses that I would have had to take mm -hmm. had I been on active duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're called the career development courses, mm -hmm. starting with the squadron officers course and the mm -hmm. command and staff school and War College, mm -hmm. those are all required courses as you right. go up through the ranks. Now, during your time in the reserves was, of course, the Vietnam era. Yes. Were you ever called to active duty or just kind of on standby? No, I, I, as a matter of fact, uh, part of the Korean, uh, part of the Vietnam War, I worked for another agency also at Griffiths Air Force Base. It was called the GIA. Ground Electronics Engineering Installation Agency. Mm -hmm. And they were an organization that was worldwide, but headquartered at Griffiths Air Force Base. And we did many designs 
of communications networks for use in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I will remember one in particular that involved a communications, a major communications link between Nha Trang in Vietnam back to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, mm -hmm. which involved uh, a tropospheric scatter communications, microwave line of sight, underwater cable through Subic Bay. And my group at GIA designed that whole network. Mm -hmm. In fact, I brought that design up to, in classified documents, up to Hanscom mm -hmm. uh, to be implemented by a contractor with us assistance and overview by GIA, particularly our Pacific GIA region. Mm -hmm. But I, I got involved in I sort of lived this dual life while I was working at GTE as a project manager. Mm -hmm. I was also in a parallel kind of thing with the military. Mm -hmm. And I did active duty every year. Mm -hmm. And I kept very, very up to date on what was going on because I was part of it. Right. See, this became, this was the beginning. Uh, of the what they call the total force concept, where it's not just the active duty organizations, but it's a combination of that and the reserves and the National Guard mm -hmm. to augment them, as they have in practically every war since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you left reserves. In 1981, tell us, and you said you mentioned that you were a project manager at GTE. Yes. So, uh, were you still in New York at the time, or were you? No, no, no I was here in uh, mm -hmm. in Needham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. okay. and also in Waltham, Massachusetts. I worked at both locations. Mm -hmm. Oh, this. Oh. Uh, oh yeah. Well, yeah. While I was at Rome, I. <laughs> Forgot to mention, I also worked on getting a master's degree in electrical engineering. Okay. And I did that with this school, Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And I oh. got that in 1955. Okay. But what I did at, uh, at uh, GTE was mm -hmm. I started out at heading up an engineering group, uh, systems engine integration group, actually. Mm -hmm which I had a fair amount of experience while I was at Rome mm -hmm. in working with the SAGE system. The SAGE system was the first large communications electronic system that we ever had for semi-automatic ground environment. It was our air defense system. And it was the one that first used the, the large scale computer which uh, was built around the design of the of the uh, the, the MIT uh -huh. uh, computer, but built by IBM. Mm -hmm. IBM made a large amount of uh, investment of their talent to uh, the Sage system, the 465L Strategic Air Command system, which I also worked on, and uh, they, they uh, were the ones that really introduced the large computer into doing things after uh, getting <clears throat> the experience they had with the, uh, mm -hmm. with the military. And when did you uh, retire? I retired in 1987 from GTE. I retired in 19, what, 1981 from the Air Force. Okay. Let's, uh, let's pause here for a moment because I, uh, you mentioned before the interview that you were part of four generations of, in, mil in the military, or well, was no, it six? No, my, my uh, dad and my, uh, my brother uh -huh. and his son and his son oh, okay. <laughs> are the four generations. I, mm -hmm. didn't, I was the exception that didn't join the Army. 
Okay. I didn't have any prejudices against the Army because <laughs> I, we grew up living close to West Point in Kingston. It's mm -hmm. only about 40 miles away. And uh, therefore, we spent our first night of wedded bliss at West Point at the, uh, at the hotel fair there. Mm -hmm. But I had run cross country at uh, West Point over flirtation walk when I was in high school. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Is um Michael, is there any um anything else you would like to mention about your military career? Well, I said I thought uh, my military career was both very challenging and very interesting. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I was being able I was in a position to do something useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able um, in turn I received much benefit from my military service from the GI Bill, without which I probably never would have been able to get a, even a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Did you join any military organizations beside the reserves? Oh yes, I've been part of the Armed Forces Communications Electronics Association for many years. Mm -hmm. And I've also been part of the the what used to be the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, which became the IEEE, mm -hmm. the Institute of Electro Electrical and Electronic Engineers, mm -hmm. which I'm a life member of. Mm -hmm. I'm also okay. a life member of the Military Officers Association. Okay. So I keep my self-interested in legislation that's going on uh, through the, particularly the, the Military Officers Association, which I get their mm -hmm. monthly monthly uh, uh, magazine and emails every course, mm -hmm. oh, very frequently. Uh -huh. So I'm up to date on what's going on in Congress, mm -hmm. what I, I might want to consider backing. So rather than sitting back in a rocking chair, I, <laughs> I, I uh, try to keep current with what's going on okay. and take part in it. Of course. Uh, Michael, is there anything else before we wrap up uh, this interview? You know, I think uh, the fact that uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with you has mm -hmm. been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, uh, oh, I got one thing to add. Go right my ahead. Wife, my wife and I both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do and have done volunteer work mm -hmm. up at the Hanscom Air Force Base Clinic. And I looked at that, I worked for like 11 years in optometry, sort of related mm -hmm. to the kind of field that I've worked in. There's so much electronics involved with optometry in... Uh, in lensometers and uh -huh. and uh, I, I got pretty well trained on the use of the various instruments that the the uh, ophthalmologists and optometrists use. So uh, I used to go and volunteer and do those tests for people, and then familiarity with computers makes things very much easier because mm -hmm. all the orders were done on the computer over mm -hmm. the internet. Oh. And my wife decided she's going to do that too, so <laughs> she joined the, the laboratory there. She's uh -huh. being a nurse. It fit right in with her background as well. And it kind of, I've always looked at it, uh, we've always looked at it as a way to sort of pay back for some of the many good things Mm -hmm. Do you still volunteer at Hanscom? Uh, no, I, I think I'm getting a little bit beyond the point mm -hmm. where they have too much need for me. If they had need for me, mm -hmm. the reason I, I don't is that optometry, they, they lost the optometrist, so most of the work is farmed out I see. to contractors. Mm -hmm. So the work that I used to do is done by contract. All right. <laughs> Well, Michael P. Forte, is there anything else before we wrap things up? 
No, I think that's uh, mm. pretty much a complete story. I mm. well, know much of my life. <laughs> and a very fascinating one, too. <laughs> Michael P. Forte, thank you so much for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Thank Project. you for having me. All right.